Fantasy TV. Is God on plan B? That is, did God have a certain idea, a certain hope, a certain dream of how things would be from the very beginning? Had something in his mind, a perfect universe, let's say, without sin, without death ever coming into it. And because he's God, he saw all the way to the end of how this hypothetical plan would be. A God who designed everything to work perfectly and never fail, which would produce unending days of innocence. So Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden before sin and death entered in. They were innocent. They didn't know the difference between good and evil. They didn't appreciate good because they didn't know evil. Did God intend for that state, that state of no knowledge, the state of no thanksgiving? You'll never find a word of thanks from either Adam or Eve in the garden before sin and death entered in because they didn't know how good they had it because they talked with God. They had peace, they had beautiful weather, and they didn't care because they were neutral, nonchalant about it because they did not know the difference between good and evil. Was it God's plan to keep that going forever and ever and ever with no sin, no savior, no death, no life really, should I say no appreciation of life? Because if the sin and the condemnation that came through Adam was not planned, if God had something else in mind, but it was wrecked by an unforeseen enemy, an enemy that God didn't know what he was going to do until he did it. This will result in two things. Number one, God is a sinner. Sin means to miss the mark. God wanted to have a perfect universe. He put his man and woman in the garden just to see what they would do, hoping the whole time that they would remain firm and fast and strong, even after he sends them a tempter, even after he makes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil desirable, even after he forbids them to eat of it. It's all a test, you see. If God had another plan in mind besides the one we're now in. He made a man. He made a woman. And he wanted them to continue in beautiful bliss. Forever and ever, amen. But just to make sure in his heart that they were of the caliber that he expected, that he designed, that he wanted. He put that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, made it the most attractive fruit in the entire garden, then told them not to eat of it, then sent the craftiest beast to accost the most innocent person, the woman. Because God wanted to see, make sure that these beings were strong and tough so that he could continue on with his beautiful plan of a flawless universe that will never contain sin and death. But then a terrible thing happened. Eve succumbed to the temptation of the tempter. She ate of the forbidden fruit. Adam joined her. And now God... His plan, 
his hopes, his dreams are shattered. This does two things, this idea, this theory. Number one, it makes God a sinner because sin means to miss the mark. If God aimed for a universe to go one way and it didn't, then he sinned. He missed the mark. And now, and then he has to repent. He has to change his mind and he has to come up with something to salvage his wrecked, idealistic plan of no sin and no death. God himself then had to wait and see what the couple would do. Because if he planned ahead of time for them to sin, then they would have to do it. But if he didn't plan ahead of time for them to sin, then they wouldn't have to do it and they would be truly free to take a path of their free choosing to the left and to the right. If that is the case, then even God would have to have stood back and seen what's going to happen making the first man and the first woman a divine, vast, really tragic experiment. A lab test that went wrong. That's the first nasty thing that would happen if God did not plan from the beginning for sin and death to enter his universe and for Adam and Eve to fail. The other thing is that God unforeseeing the terrible disaster in Eden. Kind of like a flat tire on your bicycle. What do you do? You put a patch on it. So God is now developing an alternative plan in his mind called a patch, called a fix. And that would be Christ to salvage it, to, to save what was wrecked. And so we human beings, we're all excited about salvation. And we even find out that um, the Savior of the world comes, saves everyone, and brings the universe to this thing called God all in all. And we would tend to want to thank God for that. But if, if we believe that this is plan B, and it is, if God did not intend sin and death to come into the universe, then... We really don't have God to thank, and anyone who thanks him is a hypocrite. It's a salvage job. This is not what he wanted. He's shrugging and says, I guess this is what I'm going to do. But if we're to thank anyone for this, what we will eventually have this vast appreciation of good and evil. This vast appreciation, vast appreciation, I should say, of good because of evil. This vast appreciation we now have, this thanksgiving we have for resurrection because we've tasted death. This longing for resurrection. The joy that we feel that Adam and Eve never had because they didn't know the difference between joy and sorrow. Then we, we should actually thank Adam and Eve for the whole thing because if it were not for them, we wouldn't have these deep appreciations. God didn't want it that way. God didn't want it that way, according to the theory. So we've made God a sinner, and we're hypocrites for thanking God for this Aeonian plan of appreciation, thanksgiving, and someday eternal life that we will enjoy because we've tasted that. That was never God's plan. Adam and Eve did that, so I don't know why. We don't thank Adam and Eve if, we, if, I don't know why someone who thinks God is on plan B would thank God for what has resulted. You'd have to thank Adam and Eve for screwing it up. Because they screwed it up, God put all these delicious patches on it, and now we have a patched up universe, but it feels good. But thank Adam and Eve for it. God didn't do it. So it makes God a sinner, and it takes the thanks away from him. The next thing this terrible teaching does is it denies God himself. Anyone who believes that we are on plan B,
A, has to admit God is a sinner, that God missed the mark. B, must thank someone else besides God for the way things have developed, namely, namely Adam and Eve. They get the primary thanks. God made the best of what they did, but if they hadn't done that, they started it. God didn't want that. God didn't want Adam and Eve to do that. So Adam and Eve started it. They started this entire path of sin and salvation and redemption. They started it, not God. It was not God's original plan. God didn't start this plan. They did. They started it. God made the best of what they started. Adam and Eve, they started this plan of Aeonian redemption, if God is on plan B. And C, it makes God not a God anymore. The name God in the Hebrew is Al, it means subjector. The Greek word for God, theos, same idea, placer. So I will say subjector slash placer. One who subjects other beings, other things, everything to his own will. Subjects, a subjector. Let's just get right to the truth, shall we? Because that's what I deal in here. God subjects all things to himself. He subjected Adam and Eve to his plan, and his plan was for sin and death to enter the universe. God is not a sinner. He planned for this to happen, this sin and death, this disobedience, and it happened. So, A, he's not a sinner if we believe God's on plan A. And he is on plan A because he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't have hopes and dreams, put two people out on the earth as an experiment to make sure they're good, make sure they're pure, make sure they came off the assembly line as he intended, and then wait to see what they do. And then when they do what they do, you're taken aback because this wasn't your plan, and you come up with patch after patch after patch, and then whatever is developed out of that, even if it's the salvation of all at the consummation of the eons, it's not to your ultimate credit. We have to thank the people who started the ball rolling, which is Adam and Adam and Eve. No. God intended for them to fail. God does not experiment because he subjects all things to himself. He's a subjector. That's his very name. To deny his subjection and his placership, putting people where he wants them, and his, his subjectorship, making them do what he wants them to do, to deny that is to deny God, is to deny his very essence. He's not a placer. He's an experimenter and a hoper, and a dreamer. He's not a subjector. No, because he himself has to wait and see what people are going to do if they're truly free. God subjected humanity to this realm of vanity, sin, and death so that it could be saved, so that it could be redeemed, so that it could be made immortal none of which could be appreciated without the opposite things. There's no appreciation of good without evil. Thus, the necessity of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eden was not an experiment, and if you think it was, you don't know God. You think God is a sinner, you're thanking the wrong person for the plan of the eons, and you've taken him off his throne. He's no longer a subjector and a placer. He's a hoper and an experimenter. I'll close this show by reading Romans, Romans 8, verse 20. For to vanity was the creation subjected, not voluntarily, but because of him who subjected it in expectation. To vanity was the creation subjected, not voluntarily, but because of him who subjects it. In one verse, the word subjects, occurs twice that's unusual for a word like this to occur twice in one verse this is god's name this is what he does and this is what he did at the outset of creation he subjected everything to his fiat to his declaration as surely as he spoke the sun and the moon into existence he spoke the first humans into existence and he spoke their actions into existence it was plan a that's what he wanted them to do But it had to be real to them. They had to feel the disobedience. So he comes across to them as though he's experimenting with it. But he's not. And if you think that, then you don't know God. You don't, understand. You don't know him. 
You're worshiping a different deity. A deity is not a subjector. That's his name. It was not a placer. That's his very name. And the creation did not become subject to vanity willingly, not willingly, but because of him. Well, everything happens because of him. This should be no surprise. It will come as a surprise to some. Not willingly. It's not a free will. Adam and Eve did not have a free will. Everything was subjected to vanity, that is to emptiness, to uselessness, not because of the will of the creature, but because of him who subjects it in expectation. Because of this subjection, we are promised deliverance and deliverance makes us have an expectation we expect something it feels good to expect it. it's going to really feel good when that expectation is fulfilled what is the expectation what will happen when that expectation expectation is fulfilled that the creation itself also shall be freed from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of god god is on plan a any Theology that denies that is a false theology. It does not come from God. It comes from the evil one. It dethrones him. But he will not be dethroned. He is the sovereign of the universe, causing all things to happen. Otherwise, he's not God. <laughs>